Do you guys have jellyfish by any chance? No. No. Okay. <laughs> not something you've ever carried, huh? No, it's not. That's Nate, and this is Rachel. Weird milk. Future milk. So I'm looking for pea milk. Uh, almond, rice, coconut. And they're both on a mission to find some very specific foods. Foods that could be the staples of our diet 30 years from now. Hi, do you guys have those um, protein bars made from like crickets? We do. Oh, excellent. Burgery thing is here. Meat alternatives, great. Yeah, it's right here. Okay, great. In the year 2047, our diets may be very different. And a lot of that is due to climate change. We read about the effects of climate change and we know that it's happening. But still, for many of us, the effects might be difficult to feel on a day-to-day basis. It can be easy to just put it on the back burner. It doesn't feel real. And so we wanted to create this diet of the future to demonstrate how a changing climate might change what we eat in the future. To make it feel real today. I'm Kathy Irway, and this is Why We Eat What We Eat. We asked two volunteers, Rachel Ward and Nate Cleveland, to go on our diet of the future for two days. Rachel lives in Brooklyn, and Nate, a suburb of Boston. We gave them each a list of foods that will likely be around 30 years from now. You heard some of them at the top. Pea milk, that's P-E-A, jellyfish, meat alternatives, crickets. For 48 hours, Nate and Rachel could only eat foods from that list. We chronicled their diet, and we're going to check in with them later in the show. We got the idea for this Diet of the Future from Allie Wist. I'm Allie Wist. I'm an artist and an art director and worked on the project Flooded, which is a conceptual photo essay based on climate change and food. About two years ago, Allie and a friend were working on a poetry project together. They were writing poems about sea level rise. We sort of started to try to imagine what a flooded coastline might look like and how people would be resilient despite that. And so I kept imagining this like flooded scene where people would throw a dinner party anyways and what would be available there and influenced by the coastline. Allie decided to take her imaginings a step further. She wanted to make photos of this dinner party of the future. She drew some inspiration from the Futurist Cookbook, published in the 1930s. In the book, F.T. Marinetti imagined some of what we live with today, and he was partly right. He depicted a future where technology would be a part of cooking, a time when people would be able to get their nutrition from pills and powders. He also really hated pasta, but that's a whole other thing. So Ali dove in and researched how climate change might affect what we eat in the future. She spoke with professors and futurists, environmental reporters, and read loads of papers about climate change. And then she and her collaborators began to develop recipes and style and photograph dishes that might be served at this dinner party of the future. When the project was complete, she had a series of 20 different images. Hi, Hi. Cece. Cece, nice to meet you. <laughs> I just got you a coffee. I met with Allie and her collaborator, Cece Buckley, at Allie's apartment in Brooklyn. We wanted them to show us the photos and talk through the dishes of the future that they came up with. Cece is an herbalist and a food stylist. She created the recipes and cooked the food in the photos, all based on Allie's research. And Cece was trying to create a very specific tone with the dishes. We had to figure out a way to make beautiful things feel a little bit ominous and the possibility of being hungry is real or like just that there will be feelings of absence and how do you communicate that maybe by leaving a lot of room on the plate the centerpiece of the project was a photo of a dinner party table setting it's an overhead view of a dimly lit sparsely set table with just a tiny bit of food on each plate there are no people in it Just three play settings, each with a glass of wine and water. What stands out most is the absence of bright color. Just deep blues and greens and metallic grays. Here's Allie. We were really trying to replicate that feeling of when you're looking at the water on a sunny day and it's glaring in your eyes and you sort of have to squint. The fabrics and textures being this sort of um, gritty metallic quality and the light itself is 
this sort of blue-gray with these purple flares. The food also has that same gritty quality. And at first, the food on the plates looks familiar, but as you get closer, you realize the ingredients aren't. At the very top, there is a small bowl of burdock and dandelion root hummus with sunchoke chips beneath it. And then you also see just below that fried potatoes with a vegan chipotle mayo, salted anchovies, small little bivalves, parts of a whole roasted hen of the woods mushroom, and a serving of the jellyfish salad. Dandelion root, burdock, hen of the woods mushrooms. All of these ingredients grow in the wild on the East Coast where Ali and Cece live. In their vision of the future, industrial agriculture, as it exists today, might be hard to sustain. So they think we'll have to learn how to make food with resilient, wild ingredients. Dandelion root hummus is dandelion root and burdock root and chickpeas that I was like... Are we allowed to have chickpeas? We did have yeah, chickpeas. We into that, yeah. yeah, that was horrible. Yeah. Um, and we had to research every single ingredient that came up in a recipe. It was actually very funny because she'd come up with a recipe and then email me and be like, what am I allowed to have? What do I? And I'm like, okay, give me 20 minutes. And I'd like fly through all these research articles and I'd be like, okay, you are allowed to have that for this reason. Yeah. Like, <laughs> it's, it's in our email chain somewhere. But dandelion and burdock grow everywhere under really harsh conditions, and they're super good for us. The dish at the center of the photograph is a bowl of jellyfish salad. It kind of looks like a pile of noodles. Cece dressed it in a reddish mustard vinaigrette and added slices of bright green pickled cucumber. We did the jellyfish dish, I think, as a way to talk about invasive species. People eat this stuff all the time. It's not new food. It's not In many cases, we've been eating it for like hundreds of years, maybe thousands of years. This stuff has been around and it's been around for a reason because it's hardy, because it is adaptable, because these plants and these animals partner well with humans. The point of the project wasn't to be bleak. Ali wanted to create something prescient and provocative, something that would make us think about the future. One of the backlashes I got in a comment section of an article about this was, this is so stupid. They're so dumb. We won't be able to eat oysters because they're all going to be gone. And I was like, well, no, the point is that we brought them in the conversation because they're threatened as well as being useful. And also the research changes and new things come out. And that's why we decided to do an artistic interpretation and not a literal list of what you need to be eating. I think actually a lot of the photos and the whole menu in general is pretty spot on. This is Max Elder. He's a researcher at the Institute for the Future in Palo Alto. And he's worked with Ali on some of her projects. He advises some of the biggest food companies in the world about what we'll eat decades from now. Do you do that with a crystal ball? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> if you meet any futurists with the crystal ball, uh, shake their hand and, and run away. What Max sees in the future is not pretty. Rising sea levels, but also changes in ocean acidification and ocean temperature. We'll also have... Issues around water distribution, water scarcity, and drought. All of those factors will in some way affect our diets. But Max says a major reason our food system is so vulnerable to climate change is because we eat such a limited variety of foods today. Particularly in the West. In the United States, you're almost bombarded with an abundance of choice. And behind all of these various types of foods are just like four or five different types of plants. It's all corn, soy, wheat. According to Max, the variety is all a facade. Tons of the foods that make up the American diet are either made with those four or five ingredients or eat those four or five ingredients. So think about all the kinds of bread you see at the grocery store. Most of it is just wheat. All the different cuts of meat, dairy products. There are some animals that are grass-fed, but the majority of livestock are fed corn and soy. Corn shows up everywhere, from juice to candy to toothpaste. So on the surface, we have all this variety, but at the foundation that really holds up our food system, we have very limited monocultured crops and very few types of animals that we raise and eat. And so that makes for a really fragile system. 
And a fragile system means that those four or five ingredients that everything is made out of might not be around in the future. Sorghum, flour or syrup, seaweed snacks or chips, hydroponically grown greens or tomatoes, uh, sardines. Which brings us back some to Rachel oil. and Nate and, and their diet of the future adventure. Bar for dessert. And then the hardest one of all is kernsa, which is a type of grain, but I think I'm allowed to have millet or buckwheat instead. Now remember, this is not a scientific diet. We made up the list of ingredients for this diet based on our own research, Ali's imaginings, and Max's expertise. The point here is to get a sense of what it's going to feel like to eat in the future. Here are a few of the choices we made. So right off the bat, we eliminated livestock. Livestock are one of the biggest contributors to carbon emissions, and the way most cattle are raised in factory farms isn't helping anything. We picked a carb that people don't eat a ton of now, but that has a positive environmental effect, buckwheat. It's a plant that gives back. When you grow it, it enriches the soil and protects fellow crops from weeds, pests, and disease. We swapped out beautiful grocery store produce for ugly produce. Ugly produce is often thrown away in our current food system, but in the future, we don't think we'll have the luxury of passing over an apple because it's kind of lumpy. But what to do about protein? Nate had to reckon with that one at the grocery store. Hi, do you guys have those um, protein bars made from like crickets? Cricket flour, cricket bars, and other insects are going to be big. And so is plant-based fake meat. So meatless burgers and cricket bars. That was Nate's dinner on day one. The real challenge for me is going to be figuring out when this is done, since it doesn't really visibly change as it cooks like a traditional sort of beef burger would. So I suppose the upside here is if I undercook it, it's just plants, so I'm not going to die, which is a plus. And then it was on to dessert, the cricket bar. This is not an appealing piece of food. Um, It kind of looks like a burned brownie or something worse, but it actually smells delicious. I went with the uh, apple cinnamon here, so... Hmm. It actually tastes pretty good, too. Another great source of protein is fish. But according to our futurist Max... Just 30 years from now, many of the fish that we eat today, salmon, tuna, swordfish, may not be available in the ocean because something like 90% of wild fish stocks today are either fully fished or overfished. So what does that leave us with? Creatures that are lower on the food chain. Here's Rachel. So now I'm going to get into these sardines. Huh. It smells like cat food. Yikes! That's strongly flavored. I'm gonna just put that in the fridge. Uh, So I'm about to be that guy in the office who pops open uh, a can of sardines right in the middle of the workspace. Uh, I've never eaten these before. Uh, I like anchovies, hoping these are similar. Uh, Esteban's pretty familiar with sardines. Uh, Reactions before I open them? Say a prayer. They're not the same as anchovies. Mm. Oh, yeah, those do not look appetizing. Doesn't that look great? Mm. He looks puzzled. Um, okay. These are not terrific, but I didn't immediately vomit. Another Max-approved food of the future? Bivalves. Clams, oysters, mussels, scallops. Bivalves are amazing. One adult oyster can filter up to 50 gallons of water a day. They also grow on reefs, and those reefs provide a buffer between volatile seas and urban settlements. And bivalves also increase biodiversity. They create protective habitats for other marine species. And then there's seaweed. Seaweed contains more protein than soybeans and more calcium than milk. 
So seaweed, in terms of a perfect food of the future, is high yield. It's high in protein. It's high in calcium. It's high in micronutrients. And it's very easy to grow. But it sounds like it's a perfect food now, too, right? There's no reason not to eat it. Yeah, it's a perfect food now. The issue, I think, at least in the Western world, is that chefs have yet to really dive deep into developing new types of cuisines and new types of dishes that really leverage it. Nate put that advice to use. He used nori sheets to make an omelet sushi roll of sorts. So I finished cooking up this breakfast uh, for dinner meal. Uh, My attempts to make uh, sushi with the sort of omelet and potatoes failed miserably, made a giant mess, and everything was rolling everywhere. However, uh, once I switched to more of a like burrito wrap style, I was able to uh, get something semi-functional put together. Seaweed breakfast burrito wraps, not terrible. Um, I think the seaweed actually added a nice little kind of salty edge to it. In the end, Nate was pretty pleased with the results. But Rachel was not. Because this diet has no dairy. In our vision of the future, dairy will be largely plant or nut-based. I would have, like, reached for a dairy product, like, six times today. And it's only three in the afternoon. So, like, butter, cheese, actual cream for my coffee. I can last another day, but I miss dairy so much. I miss you, dairy. I miss you, dairy. Come home. (laughs) And because Rachel was determined to live in a future where you still share your baked concoctions from home with your colleagues at the office, she made a climate change cake using the ingredients on the diet and brought it to work. It's a buckwheat apple cake. Okay. So it has buckwheat flour in it, and um, it has a varieties of apples that are, like, unusual or newer or ugly. And then it has uh, date molasses in it. Those are the big changes. It's basically what will be left in 30 years. Oh, that's right. <laughs> wow. It tastes healthy. It's not bad, but it's not, like, a cupcake. It's pretty um, bland to me. So for comparison, yesterday was your birthday and you had a carrot cake. True. Which would you say was better? Uh, this one's probably better for you. After two days, Rachel and Nate were done with our diet of the future. Hi, Rachel. Hi. Good morning. They checked in with each other so about how it went. One of the things that I've noticed is that I'm hungry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Pretty often. I didn't really think about it prior to starting this because we have a lot of food just like laying around at the office here that I will just graze on throughout the day. But what about snack bars like cricket bars? Uh, So I do have those. They're great. I really like them. I was uh, anticipating more of like a fear factor experience, I guess. Yeah. Where you'd just be like, all right, we're going to eat these bugs now. But there were no perceptible bugs? Uh, No. You're really into the cricket bars. Is that going to, like, stay with you after after we're done with this diet? Uh, unlikely. <laughs> the proteins what were particularly was, rough for Nate because he eats meat pretty much every day. You know, I'm very concerned because I don't particularly like mollusks. And, you know, sardine, you know anchovies are fine and sardines are sardines. <laughs> Growing uh, on you. But trying to envision sort of a one-for-one swap of like, all right, well, instead of this like nice piece of cod that I've cooked up to go with our dinner, let's replace that with like a can of sardines. That just seems terrible. Investigating non-meat protein options seems like something that I should probably consider at some point, but For Rachel, the diet felt like a warning to be more conscious of her eating choices now. I felt like I was in a Christmas carol and I was seeing, like, the ghost of diet future. (laughs) And the reason that I was being visited with this vision was so that I can change my behavior now to change the future. I feel like this is just an opportunity to maybe, like, to try and tighten up my own ship so that I can just have cheese in the future because that's all I really want. (laughs) Yeah, I am 100% with you. This diet was an experiment to force these two people to feel how their lives could be different in the future. And to make a world where crickets are more commonplace than burgers feel real. Real enough to make them think about how to change their behavior now. If they do, and if we all do, maybe you won't have to eat sardines at work. 
When we look towards food in the future, we might not just think about what's on the surface. We might not just think about how it tastes or what it costs, but we might think about the role that it plays in the larger system. And we might actually make purchasing decisions based on the services that that food provides. We don't really know what we'll eat in the coming decades, but we know this. The decisions we make about our diets today will affect what we eat in the future and what our kids and grandkids will eat too. Why We Eat What We Eat is a podcast from Blue Apron and Gimlet Creative. You can find a link to Ali Wiss photo project Flooded and the recipe for Rachel's climate change cake in our show notes and on our website, whyweeat.show. If you make her cake, let us know how it went. Use the hashtag whyweeat. This episode was produced by Abby Rizika, Julia Patero, Jorge Estrada, Francis Harlow, and Matt Schultz. Production assistance from Tom Cody. Creative direction from Nazanin Rafsanjani. We were edited by Wendy Dorr and mixed by Katherine Anderson and Zach Schmidt. Special thanks to Cassie Flynn and Anna LePay. Coming up next week, one of the most important factors that determines why we eat what we eat is moms. For me, my mom. So when your friends go to a Chinese restaurant, maybe with you, do they order things that you would never order? It's American. It's a free country. You can order anything you want. Together, my mom and I will go deep into how the Chinese food that you find in restaurants and the Chinese food that you cook at home became so different. You can find every episode of Why We Eat What We Eat on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you like what you hear, subscribe. Leave us a review, too. It really helps others discover the show. I'm Kathy Irway. Thanks for listening. 